Mr. Uvas, thank you so much for joining us on America's Now. Uh, you know, the Summit of the Americas is focusing on the issue of corruption. As we know, the former president, Pedro Pablo Kaczynski, was forced to resign because of allegations of misconduct and corruption. So knowing all this and, and the message that it sends, how should Peru move forward? Well, first of all, it's not an issue about Peru. Uh, if you see the CPI, the Corruption Perception Index, uh, that uh, every year Transparency International presents to the world, ranking the countries regarding the issues of corruption and grand corruption, you will see that two-thirds of the world is really affected by grand corruption in these days. And in our region, I would say that except Chile, Uruguay, and Costa Rica, the rest of uh, Latin America and Central America and North America, except Canada and the United States, are going through serious issues of corruption. We have this huge scandal of Lava Jato, uh, that's this uh, fraudulent scheme and corrupt scheme that came from Brazil. It had impact in 12 countries of, of the region. And in most of these countries, president or former presidents are in prison or they are indicted or they are just run away. In the case of Peru, it's, it's quite visible because we had President Fujimori just released by a pardon that is very much questioned in these days because apparently it was based on a fraudulent decision. Then you have former President Humala in prison with his wife. Then you have President Toledo, former President Toledo, run away, hide it in the United States pending of extradition. And then you have former President Alan Garcia and now Kuczynski that are under investigation. Of course, the daughter of Fujimori, Keiko Fujimori, is also under investigation. So it's all the political class. And this has to do with an issue that is quite clear for us, that, and that is that corruption is not episodic. In our region, in this country, corruption is systemic, it's structural. And if we want to get out of it, then we have to provide some structural and systemic solutions. And that's something that has not been happening uh, because there's been very little attention and commitment from the political leaders with uh, integrity, transparency, and uh, an open way in which decision processes are taken. Well, I want to ask you about solutions in just a moment, but you just named several former Peruvian presidents. So are you trying to say that Peru does a better job than other countries in recognizing this and, and holding these leaders feet to the fire, holding them to a higher standard in, in prosecuting them? Well, it could be interpreted in both ways. On one side is that our prosecutors now, I think they are doing a quite good work. But at the same time, it's because corruption is still very widespread in the country. Uh, but as I was say, saying, Peru is not isolated. You see, in Brazil, you have uh, pre former President Dilma. She had to step down because of corruption. Now Lula in prison. And Temer is not in prison because he has been protected by a corrupt Congress, like the Congress in Brazil. In El Salvador, you have president, former President uh, Funes run away and President Saca in prison. In Guatemala, you have former President Colom and uh, the previous president also in prison. In Ecuador, you have the vice president Glass in prison. In uh, Panama, you have former President Martinelli uh, in prison in the United States. Uh, and you can just continue counting. So that's what I was saying. It's, it's a global issue. If we look into Latin America, it's a regional issue uh, that is affecting uh, most of our countries. Is it because it is so ingrained uh, in, is it history or is it the way in making various countries work? You say this is a global issue. It is, we see it all around the world, but what is it that is so hard? Why is it so hard to get rid of? Well, because uh, it has to do with greed. It has to do with human beings too. There's Right now, we have much more money in the table than in the table of the world that we used to have 25 years ago. At the same time, issues are much more visible too. I mean, communications, you can have now on real time what's going on here or in China. And that gives also the possibility to the people to observe what is going on around. Uh, I think corruption is much more visible now than it was some decades ago. And at the same time, there's a new phenomenon that we call grand corruption that has to do with powerful actors mobilizing huge amounts of money 
and affecting human rights. And uh, grand corruption has such a big impact that it's always in the news that we have the sense that probably we have much more corruption than we had uh, some decades ago. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's what we are experiencing right now. Uh, in, you see, if just in South Korea, you had a new former president in prison now, some months ago, last year, the, the other former president also had to step down. You see President Suma in South Africa. Uh, you've seen all these huge marches around the world in Romania, in Brazil, millions of people protesting against corruption. Uh, cases in Spain, uh, uh, former President Sarkozy in France. I mean, it is, it is quite spread around the world. You touched on Brazil, and we know that uh, Odebrecht is probably the biggest corruption scandal in the world. Um, are you surprised by how far-reaching it was? What do you make of how that has progressed? Uh, first of all, Odebrecht is one of more than 16 huge companies, construction companies in Brazil. You have the big five, OAS, Camargo Correa, Andrade Gutierrez, Queiroz Galvao, and Odebrecht. Odebrecht is probably the biggest, but all the big companies of construction in, in Brazil were involved, and they were tied to this corrupt scheme that also involved Petrobras, that is the huge oil company of Brazil. So uh, we knew in many countries of the region, particularly in Peru, we knew some years ago that all these companies were doing some dirty business. This was not a surprise. Uh, it was not a surprise, and they counted with a complicit of many of the local companies and the political class here. So no reaction happened when people knew, even though that uh, these companies were bribing and, and paying favors to a political class. What I've never suspected at that time was the extension of the scheme. Uh, because now you have 12 countries of Latin America, besides Brazil, and two countries in Africa. And uh, when you analyze the case, you will see that it had always the same features. There was a common pattern going around, hitting the highest levels of the political class, paying bribes in order to obtain uh, big infrastructure countries. They overprice these, these uh, uh, projects, or then they sign addendas, and a project that should have cost only 800 million, let's say, could end up costing more than 2,000 million. And with that money that they obtain from these uh, corrupt payments, then they put more money into the system. So they had, like in Odebrecht, four layers of offshore companies and even their own bank. In order to avoid uh, questions about money laundering, they decided to buy the branch of an Austrian bank in uh, Antigua, and they manage all these bribes through these offshore companies moving the money uh, uh, behind this bank. So let's turn to the Summit of the Americas. You know, you have all these Latin American leaders meeting to discuss corruption. Are you optimistic that once it's all over and everyone goes back home that something positive will come out of it? There will be some... Not really. I think people... Uh, there's a crisis of representation in this region. Uh, most of the presidents that are coming have corruption allegations behind them. Uh, so we are not clear about the political will of those presidents that are coming here to discuss corruption. And uh, you have the president of Honduras who is questioned because an election that was not clear, and he has also some allegations regarding this. And then you can go country by country, and you will see that uh, there are several questionings to many of the governments that are right now uh, uh, ruling uh, the countries of the region. So I think that we are much more optimistic of what can be obtained from civil society and the private sector discussing issues of corruption than what probably will come out from the official summit. Even though I think that the Peruvian government on the technical side has done a very good work, the idea is to present to the official summit an agenda where they can uh, arrive to concrete commitments that could be then followed up by civil society organizations or uh, other mechanisms of, of the countries in order to see if they are going to comply. Mr. Ugas, thank you so much for your insight. We appreciate you joining us on America's Now. Thank you.